everyone. Thank you so much for joining us online at Gateway Church of Visalia. We're so glad that you're watching here with us. You know, we've been social distancing for a while now, but that hasn't stopped us from spiritually connecting with God and with each other. And so we just want to applaud you, man. Great job continuing to connect with us online. It's been incredible, the attendance we've seen, the response that we've seen, and the reach that we've had on our community and around the world. And so uh, we thank you for that. Each week we're having new guests fill out connection cards saying, hey, I'm new here, and we're able to connect with those. We even had people that have accepted Christ for the very first time, which has just been incredible to see God move in this time. Hey, we want you guys to continue to use the hashtag Gateway Don't Quit. You know, anytime that you're meeting with a small group or you're watching church online or you're doing things with your kids, uh, man, we would love to see that hashtag because we want to be encouraged together that we're continuing to stay spiritually connected. With that in mind, if you haven't filled out a connection card already, uh, right below here there's a link where you can fill out a connection card. It's a great way to let us know that you're watching here today and also fill out prayer requests. And if you're new, fill that out. We want to know who you are. We want to connect with you and get you a free gift. That would be awesome. So uh, fill out that form. If you have kids today that are grades 6 and under, you can go to our link below for kids and you can uh, download the curriculum there and you can have Children's Church right in your home. And you know, the reach that we've had and the impact that we've had is because of you. Uh, you guys have been sharing this, you've been liking this, you've been commenting, you've been engaging and interacting with Gateway Church online. And so we ask you to continue to do that. You can share this feed on your Facebook or YouTube uh, channels, or you can even share the link of the website. If you're watching on our website or app, we would love for you to do that because we want to continue to spread the message of the hope of Jesus Christ today. Well, we're going to uh, get ready to worship the Lord here in a moment. And a great way that we love to worship here at Gateway is through our giving, saying, God, you're number one in our life. You're number one in our finances. And so you can give several ways. You can give on our website. There'll be a link again. Uh, you can give uh, through texting. You just text the amount uh, to 84321. Again, text the amount to 84321. And you can give that way or you can continue to mail in your gift. So we're going to go ahead and head over to the worship band. God bless you. Let's get ready for a great service today.
were slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave
His favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May His favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May His favor be upon you for a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may you stay
Good morning, church. We're glad you're here. We're, we haven't closed our church. We've just moved our meeting online. So we are glad you've come uh, to meet with us this morning and to study the Word of God and to see how it applies to our lives because we ask the most important question and then we say, how do we apply this to our lives? Uh, the National Academy of Sciences published an article back in 2018 about how uh, Israel was the most literate culture in the ancient world. And in that article, they say the educational infrastructure of Judah could support composition of the biblical texts. Uh, they were people of the book. Uh, they read and they wrote the pages of Scripture. So when we come to a king like King Asa, we can easily picture him uh, one night not being able to sleep very well and going down to the archives uh, of his palace and reading some of the history of his father and his uh, grandfather. In fact, we can picture him scrolling back through the historical books, coming to his great-great-grandfather, uh, King David. So if you take out your sermon notes and follow along, you can take a few notes and you can hear about some of the kings of Israel. Uh, it says of King David, the Lord said to the prophet Samuel when he went to anoint the next king of Israel, uh, the king was Saul, it was going to become David, but he says to Samuel, God says to Samuel, don't look at Eliab, which was the first son of Jesse, a big man, looked very regal. Don't look at Eliab's appearance or at the height of his stature. I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Uh, the heart is what is important to God. Over 800 times. In the Old Testament, we're going to hear about the heart and why the heart is important. In fact, in the pages of uh, Scripture, uh, the heart is used of decisions that are made. Uh, Pharaoh's hard heart in Exodus chapter 7 is based on all the previous decisions that Pharaoh has made. And it creates a consequence in Pharaoh's heart, his heart becomes hardened because of his previous decisions. It, the word hard is used of emotions in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Love the Lord your God with all your heart uh, because the heart creates commitment. What we love, we become committed to. Uh, the heart is used in the Old Testament of courage. Uh, it says in 2 Samuel chapter 17, uh, that the heart of the warriors of David uh, were hearts like uh, lionesses. It, it, the heart is used of a lioness who has cubs and uh, will become ferocious and protect them from any kind of uh, uh, opponent, invader, any kind of, uh, uh, of coyote or wolf that wants to come and devour uh, the cubs. The heart of a lioness is felt to be the most courageous, the most ferocious kind of heart uh, that you could have. It's so important. The heart is so important that even in the New Testament, Luke says of David in Acts 13, he raised up David uh, to be the king of Israel con concerning whom he also testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man <clears throat> after my own heart who will do all uh, my will. Ace is reading through the pages of the historical books about his great-great-grandfather, uh, David. Uh, he knows David's heart for God. He also knows about Solomon's heart. Uh, Solomon was Ace's great-grandfather. And it says that when Solomon first became king, he prayed to God, So give thy servant a wise and understanding heart to judge thy people, to discern between good and evil. Solomon had a great start, uh, but a great start doesn't necessarily necessitate a great finish or a great uh, ending. Uh, we know that David conquered the uh, Moabites and the Ammonites, and, and he conquered uh, the Edomites and, and the Sidonians and the Hittites, and he drove the Philistines into the sea. Uh, those ethnic groups and tribes around Israel, uh, David conquered, only to find his son goes and 
marries the daughters of all of those kings that David conquered. And he brings the daughters to Jerusalem and he brings them into his palace. And so it says of Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 11 uh, that Solomon's heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God uh, the way David's was. Each wife that Solomon married had to have an altar to worship the God that had come with them from the foreign tribe. And so Solomon built pagan altars all over Israel and those wives with their gods drew Solomon away from wholeheartedly serving uh, the God of Israel. But we're back with Asa in the palace and he's reading the historical books and he comes across his grandfather, King Rehoboam. And it says in Second Chronicles that Rehoboam did evil because he did not set his heart to seek the Lord. Uh, he did not seek the Lord's justice and his grace. Uh, Rehoboam becomes king of uh, all 12 tribes of Israel. Jeroboam comes as the, uh, uh, the representative of 10 of those tribes, and he says to Rehoboam, uh, your father has uh, put us under all of this strain and work and taxes so that they could build Jerusalem and the palace and the temple of the Lord, and can we, can we have a slight reprieve from the taxes and the work? And Rehoboam goes to the elders of Israel, and he says, what do you think I should do? And they say, give Jeroboam what he wants. Solomon drove them hard. Uh, they need a little time off. Rehoboam turns to his young friends and says, uh, what do you think I should do? Uh, we think you should take the whip and uh, increase the load, increase the taxes, increase the work, increase the cities of Israel. And so Rehoboam goes back and he speaks harshly. And all of a sudden he finds himself in a civil war and Jeroboam forms a union. And he takes ten of the tribes of Israel and they form their own nation. And throughout the rest of the Old Testament they will be called Israel, those ten tribes. All that is left with Rehoboam is the tribe of Benjamin and the tribe of Judah. And they will be called Judah throughout the rest of the Old Testament. Forever the nation will be split because uh, someone's heart was not set to follow the Lord. And then King Asa comes to the historical part about his own father, uh, King Abijah. And, and it says that King Abijah, his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, like the heart of his father, David. Uh, it says that he walked in all the sins of his father, served the foreign gods that Solomon had brought. And, and then Asa begins to kind of reflect on uh, who he's going to be. He is now the king of Israel, the king of Judah. He is now the one who is going to be uh, leading the people of Judah. And he has to decide, what kind of a king? How will I lead? Will I lead like my great-great-grandfather David, or will I lead like my father Abijah? And it says in 1 Kings chapter 15 that Asa made a uh, wonderful decision. And Asa did what was right in the sight of the Lord, like David, his great-great-grandfather. And the heart of Asa was wholly devoted to the Lord all the days of his life. And the first ten years of Asa's reign were, were wonderful years. He was a tremendous reformer. Uh, he eliminated all the prostitution of Israel, especially the male prostitution that was around the pagan temples of, of uh, Solomon's reign. He removed and he destroyed all of the idols of the nation. He removed uh, the mother, his own mother, the queen, Makkah. Uh, she was following foreign gods and worshiping publicly and he removed her from office. <laughs> How would you like to remove your own mother uh, from being queen uh, of the nation. But Asa did it. Uh, he said, we are going to follow the Lord our God wholeheartedly, like David did. He restored the temple vessels. They, the golden vessels that were in the temple had been removed and had been used in 
pagan worship sites, and Asa gathered all of those, and he brought them back to the temple of God, and he had a a grand dedication ceremony, and he replaced them and began to use them for their proper uh, purpose. He dedicated the people. He brought them together, and he said, together we are going to make a vow before God, and we are going to worship him only, and we are going to be wholehearted, dedicated followers. And then he rebuilt the altar of God in front of the temple. Uh, The sacrifices had ceased, the altar had crumbled, and Asa had the priests rebuild it. And they dedicated it, and they began to offer sacrifices to God, and they began to wholeheartedly follow. The first 10 years of Asa's reign was a wonderful time of reform, but a crisis is on the horizon for Asa. It says, Zerah, the Ethiopian, came out against Judah with an army of a million men and 300 chariots. Uh, Judah had no chariots. Uh, they did not have the technology and they did not build chariots. They, they, they had few horses. Uh, but this Ethiopian king comes with a million men marching to Judah 300 chariots and horses. So Asa went out to meet him, and they drew up in battle formation. And Asa was uh, worried. It's like bringing a BB gun to a battle with a tank. Uh, He doesn't have the men. He doesn't have the equipment. uh, He doesn't have the ability. And he thinks back when he was reading the historical books in his palace. He thinks back, uh, what would my great, great, grandfather David had done in this situation? What would he have done? And he remembers when David comes to the uh, technological wonder of his century called Goliath. And David takes a sling and five rocks and walks down into the valley of Elah. And he uh, speaks before all of the nation of Israel and before all of the Philistines. And David says, To Goliath the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, a spear, a javelin, armor, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands, and I will strike you down and remove your head from you, and I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. I mean, this is David at his best, at his grandest. Uh, Don't you always wish you could be at your best? Don't you always wish uh, you could follow the Lord wholeheartedly? And, And so, Asa remembers the words of uh, David in his speech, but he looks at this army and in prayer it says that Asa called to the Lord his God and he said, Lord, there's no one beside you to help. <laughs> there, is, there is no hope. Uh, there is no way we're going to come out of this alive. Our whole kingdom is going to be overrun by the Ethiopians. There's no one beside you to help. We're at the bottom of of our hope. In the battle between the powerful and those who have no strength. And then he says this, so help us. That's the essence of his prayer. That's the entire prayer. Help us, O Lord, our God, for we trust in you and in your name have come against this multitude from Ethiopia. Oh, Lord, you are our God. Let not man prevail against you. I, I mean, that's, that's not great equipment uh, in some people's minds. Uh, we come against this multitude in your name. Uh, a million men, swords, spears, javelins, bows, arrows, chariots, horses, Verses, a name, the name of the Lord. Uh, so God, you've got to help us. Have uh, you ever felt like that? Uh, the, the, the odds of success 
uh, the illness that is against you, uh, the news that has come, uh, the sense that there is no hope in the future, there are no answers. Uh, here are all of the array uh, uh, of, the, of the villains and the foes and the armies that we face, and what do we have? A name, the name of the Lord. So Lord, if you don't help us, uh, we have uh, no hope. And God's response to King Asa, what did God do in response to King Asa's wholehearted devotion to God? So the Lord routed the Ethiopians before Asa, and the Ethiopians fled, and there was that day a great military victory. I mean, you know, just think of King Asa. Every year at the State of the Union address for Judah, he gets up and he, and he says, remember what God did. When there was no hope and everything we faced seemed bleak and, and, and there was just no hope. And yet God gave us a great victory that day. And I'm sure Asa recounted over and over and over again before his high government officials how great God was. And what a great delivery he made that day. Remember well, the next 25 years of King Asa's reign were uh, great peace and prosperity. It says they entered into a covenant with God after that victory to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all of their heart and all of their soul. And there was no more war until the 35th year of Asa's reign. He has been on the throne of Israel for 35 years, and he's enjoyed nothing but economic upward success and mobility, uh, peace and prosperity, what uh, Francis Schaeffer calls uh, personal peace and affluence that we enjoyed in the 20th century, Asa enjoyed in his century. Uh, but a second crisis comes to the reign of of Asa in his 35th year on the throne. In the 36th year of Asa's reign, Basha, the king of the 10 tribes of Israel, uh, those that followed Jeroboam and have been separated now for decades uh, from Judah, Basha came up against Judah. And then Asa, well, he probably did what he did against the Ethiopians. He got down on his knees and he said, Lord, we're in this civil war. Basha is coming against us. We have no hope. Help us. No. That's not what Asa does. It says Asa went into the temple of God and he brought out the silver and the gold that he had dedicated to the temple to be used in the treasuries of the house of the Lord and the king's house. And he sent them to the king of Aram, a man by the name of Ben-Hadad. You know, his female ancestor had been one of the wives of Solomon. Ben-Hadad was a descendant of the kings of Aram. And... Uh, Maybe Asa had broken down the pagan altar that the, the wife of Solomon from Aram had built generations before. We don't know. But we do know that Asa went and he sent all of the gold from the temple to Ben-Hadad, the king of Aram, and he said, let there be a treaty between you and me. And so Ben-Hadad said, great, I'd love some gold for a treaty. And he listened to King Asa and he sent the commanders of his armies with Asa against the cities of Israel, and when Basha heard of it, he stopped. Uh, the strategy worked. Peace, prosperity, no war, because Asa had made a covenant with a pagan king who served a pagan god. Uh, Everybody saw the result. Uh, the end justifies the means. A and everybody saw the result. And they celebrated the IQ of King Asa, except 
a, a man by the name of uh, Hanani. Hanani was a prophet of God. And Hanani in 2 Chronicles 16 came to Asa, king of Judah, and he said to him, Don't you remember the Ethiopians? Were, were not the Ethiopians an immense army with very many chariots and horsemen? And yet, because you relied on the name of the Lord, God delivered them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart, those whose heart is completely his. You, Asa, have acted foolishly in this. Indeed, from now on, you will surely have wars. And when he finished his speech, he could tell by the flush of the king's face and by his clenched fists on the arms of his throne and by the flash of anger in his eyes, he had made his point. And Hanani thought for a fleeting moment that maybe Asa would repent see the error of his ways, apologize to God. But Asa doesn't do that. He takes Hanani by the scruff of the neck and he puts him in prison and sends him away. All of a sudden, God brings something personal to King Asa at the end of his reign in his 39th year as king of Judah. Asa becomes diseased in his feet. His disease was so severe uh, but as severe as it was, he did not seek the Lord. He sought the physicians. Now, there's nothing wrong with seeking a physician. But Asa's problem really wasn't physical. Asa's problem was spiritual. And yet, his physical problem does not create a desire in Asa's soul to fall down on his knees and say, Lord, there's no hope. Help. Asa doesn't do that. Asa then... Uh, slept with his fathers, having died in his 41st year as king. Well, that's the end of our story of Asa. Uh, we have to ask our most important question, so make sure you ask this question, all right? Take a deep breath. Here we go. One, two, three. So what? What difference does the life of Asa make in my life 3,000 years later? Well, when your heart is in the right place, when your heart is is in the right place. You can, number one, pray short prayers that have enormous implications. Short prayers like, Lord, help me. There's no hope. Short prayers can have enormous uh, implications. Uh, you know, I've, I've listened to really well-written prayers in my life. Uh, wonderful theology, theological treatises, perfect grammar, uh, rhythmic phrases, uh, lofty language, the right thing said at the right time, but somehow, sometimes you walk away from those situations and you think, it didn't seem like there was the right heart. Uh, you can pray very short prayers that have enormous implications. Uh, secondly, when your heart's in the right place, uh, you can pray simple requests that have complex results. Uh, Asa prays, God, help. And all of a sudden, the military strategy comes to him. All of a sudden, uh, he has got the right weapons of warfare. He's coming in the name of God, and God is fighting for him, and he has success. You can, if your heart is in the right pray, place, you can pray in urgent circumstances and have miraculous consequences. Back in uh, 1912, the Titanic sailed from Liverpool, England, and on April 15th, it struck an iceberg and it sank. Uh, aboard that ship was a man by the name of John Harper, and he had his six-year-old daughter with him. And when the ship struck the iceberg, he took his daughter and put her in a lifeboat, and he stayed on the ship. And he went everywhere talking to people on that ship about the Lord Jesus Christ, because John Harper uh, was a Scottish evangelist. Uh, he had been called by Dwight L. Moody to come 
and candidate at Moody's church because Moody was retiring and they felt John Harper was the right replacement for Moody. And so he was on his way to accept that pastorate. And and so when they struck the iceberg, he put his daughter in the lifeboat and he began to speak to people on board the ship. And he began to say, "Uh, you've got to be saved by uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he went everywhere and some people responded and some people uh, didn't. In fact, one man rebuffed him so strongly that John John Harper took off his light vest and gave it to the man, and he said, you need this more than I do. And finally, when the ship sank and John Harper uh, hit the frigid water of the North Atlantic, he swam from debris field to debris field, uh, speaking to people about the fact they needed to be saved by Jesus Christ. He came to one man just to be rejected, and, and in his confusion and hypothermia, he came back to that man a second time. He had a second chance, and he responded. He accepted Jesus as his Savior, and a few moments later, John Harper slipped below the surface of the icy cold water of the Atlantic. Four years later, 1916, Ontario, Canada, uh, a survivor's reunion from the Titanic. As many as could come got together at that first survivor's reunion. And people got up and told their stories. And one man got up and told his story. And he concluded his remarks by saying this, I am the last convert of Pastor John Harper. He was the man that watched John Harper die from hypothermia, having just responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, You know, when your heart is right, you'll live well. When your heart is right, wholeheartedly devoted to God, you'll live well, whether in life or in death. And as we look at our circumstances today, and we look at what's going on in our world, uh, you know, we can look at this and see a hopeless situation, or we can look at a situation that causes us to drop down on our knees and not pray flowery theological treatises, but just to pray simple prayers like King Asa. Lord, the situation is hopeless. Help us. Help us. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for this day. We are thankful that we come in your name. Uh, We want to be wholehearted followers of yours. And and Father, we just ask that you would uh, stay as as productive and as real and, 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 and as close to us now and throughout our lives. Help us to not fall away like Solomon or like Rehoboam. Help us to stay tightly connected to you. And as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, maybe you are watching this on whatever platform and you're saying, you know, I've never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. We're going to give you the opportunity to do that. If you'd like to do that, I'm going to pray a prayer out loud and you can pray this prayer silently and you can say, Dear Father, uh, thank you that Jesus Christ died on a cross for all of my sins. I put my total trust and faith in him for eternal life. Help me to be a wholehearted follower of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name. So, Father, we thank you for this passage and this life of King Asa, that he was uh, wholly devoted to you. Even at the end of his life, he made an error But, Father, we recognize that you called him a wholehearted and uh, wholehearted, devoted follower of yours. And, And we pray that our lives would reflect the early life of King Asa and help us to learn from his mistake that devotion to Jesus Christ needs to go a lifetime. Help us to do that in the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
It's been a joy worshiping with you today in your home. Thanks for joining us. Uh, what a great message from Pastor Ed as we looked at King Asa's life. I hope that you are encouraged and uh, empowered to live for Christ this week in your context. Hey, we want to just, uh, again, if you haven't filled out a connection card, we'd love for you to do that, especially if you're watching today and you say, I have accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Then we want to tell you, greatest decision you could ever make and we want to celebrate you we want to say congratulations and we want to help you on this new journey that you're going on so fill out that connection card just mark that i accepted jesus today we're going to follow up with you personally and we would love to connect with you and make sure to continue to use the hashtag gateway don't quit we want to see those photos of what's going on in your life and in your world if you would like to give you can do that on our website you can text the amount to 84321 you can mail it in and uh, we're looking forward to another great week god bless you gateway and uh, we'll see you around